welcome everybody to this uh, Can You Dig It um, webinar on Scottish rock art. Uh, it's, going to, it's going to be a fantastic evening. I think we've got some great um, speakers lined up for you. But I'll just do what I always do, which is um, talk you through a little bit through the Galloway Glens for those of you who, who don't know us. Um, we're a five year suite of projects um, funded by the National Lottery Heritage Fund and um, based here in Southwest Scotland. So I know there are some locals tuned in, but um, there's also a lot of people from all around the world. So it's a very beautiful part of the world. And when you can, you should come and see us. Um, we cover an area, it's a very rural area, um, and the Galloway Glens covers, from, for those of you who know, from Cars Fen in the north, through the Glen Cairns villages, past beautiful Loch Ken, Castle Douglas, and out to the sea at Kukubri, which is where some of our um, work is focusing today. So that's Galloway Glens. We've got 36 projects going on over the five years. Um, it'll bring in five million pounds worth of funding to the area over those five years, um, thanks to the core funding for the National Lottery Heritage Fund and then all our partners. And of those 36 projects, uh, Can You Dig It is one of our, our flagship ones, really. It's our community archaeology project, uh, and that's match funded by Historic Environment Scotland. And um, we're very grateful to them for their funding um, as well that allows us to put this on. We started in 2019, we'll be going through to 2022 with Can You Dig It? We started with digs and explorations workshops in 2019, some of you went on them I think, um, but now of course we've moved online largely, um, well, <laughs> exclusively. Hoping to get back to it, but, but who knows, um, but summer, next summer we're hoping to be back out there with you all. Uh, Can You Dig It's delivered by Rathmel Archaeology. Uh, and their senior archaeologist Claire Williamson is here, as ever, to uh, support us. I think some of you are getting to know Claire by now. So um, I'll just move on to the, uh, to the speakers. Um, we've got Joanna valdez Tullet. Joanna is the postdoctoral research assistant for Scotland's Rock Art Project. Um, SCRAP, great acronym. She's been working with rock art for the last 17 years, with experience in rock art research at various periods, from Paleolithic to Iron Age art, and a special focus on Atlantic rock art about which she completed her PhD in 2017 at the University of Southampton, published in 2019. Uh, Joanna's researched rock art in a number of Western European countries, such as Portugal, Spain, Britain, and Ireland. And her approaches often include landscape archeology, span theory and methods, and the usual of spatial analysis and network science to investigate the cultural and social contexts of rock art. So gonna be some fascinating insights for us. Um, Lisa, Alan, some of you will know, uh, is uh, closer to home. She's uh, an ecologist turned amateur archaeologist, best sort. Um, a love of the natural history, uh, a love of the natural world, history and art led her to the Scottish Rock Art Project via an introductory lecture at the Kukubri History Society. Uh, Lisa was born and raised in York, East Yorkshire and her studies and her work have taken her to Southwest England and Wales, but she's been settled in Galloway for the past 11 years and now considers it home. Lisa's re recently completed studying for an MLIT in Museum and Gallery Studies, part-time with St Andrews University. And although she didn't put this, I know that she's been a key player in the Kukubri branch of Scotland's Rock Art Project. So um, thank you, Lisa, for all your efforts with that. I think that's um, everything I wanted to say. So I'll hand you over to uh, Joanna. So uh, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for your introduction, um, Claire and, uh, sorry, Helen, and uh, for inviting me to deliver this talk. And everyone who's joining us, tonight or this afternoon or I don't know wherever you are. Um, so essentially I will be talking about prehistoric rock art in Scotland but I will also be um, giving some insights into uh, Scotland's rock art project from um, that I will be calling SCRAP from here on uh, which is our acronym uh, and uh, and that is mostly it. Um, so I'm sure that most of you will know uh, that the expression rock art is usually uh, used to refer to images that have been carved or painted and sometimes sculpted on natural rock surfaces in deep caves, shelters or open air contexts. And humans have been creating rock art for a very long time and recent research has even shown that uh, some of the Paleolithic caves uh, in Spain could have been painted 50,000 years ago and this pushes back the chronology of rock art for in almost 20,000 years. Um, we have rock art all over the world basically um, and we can even consider that it's being created nowadays if you'd like. So perhaps the rock art that we are all more familiar with is that of the Paleolithic caves as I've mentioned in the north of Spain and in France uh, and they're very very vivid and remarkable depictions of animals. In fact animals are um, definitely a favorite topic that we see repeated all over the world being carved and painted all over the world 
Um, and when we can identify the types of designs that uh, are portrayed in the rock art, we tend to talk about them as figurative art. Other examples are, for example, the boats in Scandinavia, weapons, houses, some of them we find in Italy, for example, um, and they're also depictions um, of people. However, the majority of the rock art motifs are indeed are geometric and abstract, uh, even in the Paleolithic caves, although um, we have we are, we tend to look at the animals because of their beauty and vibrancy um there are lots of uh, lots of uh, geometric signs that tend to be overshadowed by these dominant figures of animals and so all over the world we see geometric designs and symbols painted and carved throughout time and they usually don't get as much attention as a figurative art because they are a lot more difficult to interpret and we don't necessarily relate to them the same way that we do with the animals. So Scotland's uh, prehistoric rock art falls within this category of, geograph of geometric and abstract rock art. For those of you who may not be familiar with Scotland's geographic uh, location, and I'm sure that everyone is, um, Scotland is the northernmost country in the United Kingdom, and you can see it uh, in the red square on the screen. Um, and we are obviously located on the western part um, of Europe. So aside from some uh, sporadic references in the late 18th century. Um, the first official rock art find in Scotland uh, dates to uh, the 19th century with the publication by Archibald Curry in 1830, in which he reports the carved stones around Cairnban in, in Kilmartin in Argyll. So soon after that, in 1866, Greenwell mentions a great number, and I'm quoting here, a great number of the small pits which are found so often associated with concentric circles on standing stones at Nedelargi and Balamino in uh, Kilmartin, and various rocks that are profusely covered with enigmatic circular motifs. Um, in that same year, we see uh, Sir James Young Simpson, um, who was a Scottish aristocrat uh, and also an obstetrician, uh, renowned for discovering the anesthetic properties of chloroform uh, and who is very interested in the rock art and he also carries out um, extensive field work locating um, a lot of, uh, of carved panels and his approach is really interesting and quite different from other uh, people from his time because he also remarks on the different context of, of the carvings. In fact, um, his publications are in general quite interesting because he not only tells us about the rock art or his finds but he also um, makes these really uh, intricate illustrations and also writes quite pertinent text about it so he provides more information than what we usually get. Um, however the interest in rock art in Scotland as with many other places was never constant and, um, and there are large periods of time in which there is very little being said about it. So um, after that initial interest in, in the rock art, it is in fact only in the second half of the 20th century that we see a boost in rock art studies, um, particularly during the 60s, 70s and 80s. And for example, we see the work of Marion Campbell in Argyle um, and later Ronald Morris, who surveyed large parts of the country um, and published a number of gazetteers that are still today referenced to anyone who is interested in rock art. Also following on Morris's steps, we see Martin Van Hoek in the 80s and the 90s, um, covering a lot of ground, doing a lot of field work and recording of the rocks. And uh, together they found quite um, an extensive number of, uh, of new panels. Also in the 1990s, the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland, so RCAMS, which was found, uh, founded in 1908, published a comprehensive archeological survey um, of Eastern Perth and Kinross and Dumfrieshire. Um, and so we now have a very large catalog of, of uh, rock art of Scotland, um, but we still don't know very much about um, the implications of, of the rock art for the past communities. So our understanding of it is still quite limited. So in the UK, there are about 6,000 carved rocks or 6,000 known carved rocks, one third of which are located in Scotland. In the beginning of Scrap, we collated this database um, 
with all the known carved rocks in Scotland, which inc included the record for Kenmore, which is a national inventory, um, the local HERs, um, which are the, the local authorities related to the councils, and other private gazetteers. And on the outset of the project, we have a total of 2,795 rocks to record, which you can see in the red dots on the map. So this map also gives, an, gives us an idea of um, the distribution of uh, rock art in Scotland, which as you can see is quite uneven. So some of the denser areas are located in the west coast in Kilmartin, for example, which is home for more than 700 panels, that is 20% of the total rock art in the country. Um, and there are also other impressive concentrations in Perthshire, in Stirlingshire, um, in the central belt of the country, uh, Angus in the east and Dumfries and Galloway in the southwest. In fact, Dumfries and Galloway has one of the highest densities of rock art in the country and also um, a group of very complex type of rock art. Uh, areas like much of the Highland region and the Scottish borders have very few recorded sites, um, although we are finding more and more um, during the course of the, uh, of the project. And uh, we are not sure why uh, these areas are um, empty at the moment, but we suspect that there's a combination of factors. So uh, probably relating to uh, research bias or so where people tend to focus on other regions where rock art is already known. Um, perhaps these regions, these areas were more inhospitable and not so attractive for livelihood. Um, if they were inhabited, perhaps the local communities could have other means to express themselves and not be so interested in carving or uh, the rocks could have also or, or can also be still covered up by peat and turf um, or perhaps they were um, destroyed due to higher degrees of erosion and there may be other reasons uh, that can explain these uh, these emptier areas. So the rock art in Scotland is essentially geometric and abstract. Um, there are no known figurative motifs uh, to part of this of this imagery in Scotland to the period that we're working it uh, with, um, and uh, the more iconic motifs that we that we tend to identify are the cut marks, which are small circular hollows dug onto the rocks um, onto the rock surface, often surrounded by one or more concentric circles, making what we today call cup and ring marks. Um, and there are many variations of these motifs. For example, the circles can be complete, gapped, or we can have a combination of both. Um, the inner cut mark can be quite large sometimes. Uh, we can have cut marks on the rings or, you know, at the end of the, um, between the gaps of the circles. Uh, often these cup and rings also have a line coming from their central cut mark or from one of the circles, which we tend to call radials or tails. And the iconography also includes uh, rosettes that you can see on the uh, on the uh, top right uh, picture, which are arrangements of cup marks um, that can be encircled by a ring with or without um, a more prominent central cup. Uh, we have key rings as well, uh, which you can see on the bottom right. Um, also spirals and ovals. And although all of these shapes are very similar, of course this rock art was made by humans and so um, there could be a lot of other variations. Although they tend to respect this one kind of um, imagery and repeat it in every rock um, with several different types of combinations. So um, the motifs are sometimes carved on, in isolation. So you can have one rock with one motif or one, walk, one rock with uh, one or two motifs, or they can be extensively repeated and create really complex compositions, sometimes interlinked with linear grooves, which are also quite common in this type of rock art. Um, the carvings were made uh, by pecking, which essentially uh, was um, a technique in which they would hit the rock surface with a stone tool, such as, such as a large river pebble, for example. Um, and, uh, and in, in, in this process, we can also sometimes find um, some marks of, of the stone tools still uh, on the, uh, the uh, motifs. So at the moment, we only know about carved examples of this type of rock art. We don't know of any paintings, which does not mean that um, these were absent. Perhaps these motifs were being painted in other types of materials, for example. Perhaps uh, these carvings were painted over, although we don't have any evidence for that. 
Um, however, we know that when they would uh, carve the rocks, the core of the, of the rock would be exposed and this in itself would create contrast with the rock surface and the motifs would then be quite visible for at least a certain amount of time because we also know that um, weathering was relatively quick to happen. Um, and, uh, and so these motifs were then carved preferentially in uh, outcrops and boulders in the open landscape. Um, they tend to use flat surfaces, horizontal surfaces, very often flush with the ground, making them quite invisible um, in the landscape. And for us, sometimes very difficult to find because they tend to get overgrown. However, there are a few exceptions. Balagmail on your left is possibly the most extreme of these exceptions. And this is a very large and completely vertical wall in which cut mark and cut mark cut mark ring motifs were carved. And there are also some examples of motifs carved under um, overhangs, like the example from the bin on your right. Um, but these are quite exceptional, so uh, we don't usually expect to find them. So as I said, this tradition of prehistoric rock art is essentially a landscape art. Um, the outcrops and the boulders are mostly found in open settings. Um, in more or less low-lying locations, such as fertile river valleys or on hillsides, in the sorts of places where people would have lived and farmed in the past, we, we think. Um, they also seem to follow natural pathways through the landscape, many of which um, have been historically used as drove roads, and today they are um, often used as walking routes. So all of the characteristics that I have just described can also be found in other regions across uh, Western Europe. So the prehistoric rock art in Scotland is in fact part of a wider carving tradition uh, that is also known as Atlantic rock art, um, a term that personally I find describes this uh, geographic scope really well and I tend to use. Um, and so in these other countries that you can see in the map, uh, essentially, um, in areas of England, uh, Ireland, Portugal and Spain, we also see the same type of cup marks, cup and rings, spirals, rosettes being carved in similar settings, um, in similar types of uh, flat outcrops and boulders in the open landscape. And although there are all these similarities between these regions, it is quite interesting to note that there are also some very um, slight differences which confer different personalities to each of these of these regions. So there are some regional um, preferences. So although I said that the rock art in Scotland is essentially carved in outcrops and boulders, we also find cup marks and cup and, cup and ring marks um, occasionally on rocks built into Neolithic and early Bronze Age monuments such as burial cairns, stone circles and standing stones. Some of these carvings appear to have originally been on, on natural rock surfaces and in the open landscape and then deliberately quarried or moved um, for reuse in, um, in the monuments. And others were probably made when the monuments were uh, constructed. We also see carved stones being reused in later structures. So for example, we have some examples of cup and rings being found in Iron Age hill forts, in Brochs, suit terrains, particularly in the area of Angus, for example, and even uh, picture standing stones uh, that were created in, um, in, in stones or transformed from stones which were already uh, carved with prehistoric rock art. So the rock art in the monuments that I have just referred um, and the rock art in the, um, in, in the landscape as well um, is sometimes placed side by side with what we also call megalithic art or pa passage grave art, which is probably best known uh, from, from their examples in Ireland and Brittany. However, although the, uh, the, the designs are slightly familiar, we have the same type of swirly undulating kind of lines um, they, they can be, they are essentially different. And, and also in this case, um, the orthostats or the, the stones that compose the structures of the, of the monuments were deliberately decorated with motifs um, for that purpose. Um, and so I'm just putting this here, just mentioning this here, um, just to say that I'm not going to be talking about this tonight, uh, but is also another realm of decoration uh, from this type of period that resembles, that has some resemblances with the open air art. So when was the rock art created? Dating rock art is really problematic, especially when we're dealing with carvings. Um, 
although there are techniques and analysis that we can carry out uh, on pigments and other organic materials and even on organic materials um, usually associated with painting with painted rock art that can offer precise dating um, so for example radiocarbon dating or uh, uranium series for example which is uh, used in in caves essentially these methods cannot be used for carvings at least not for now um, so unlike painted rock art carvings are obviously cut into natural rock and they don't tend to have any deposits that can provide any precise dates. So the main way to date card rock, uh, card rock art is usually through stylistic comparisons, which we tend to call relative dating methods. And so for a very long time, this type of rock art was seen as being a product of the Bronze Age. And this is because portable blocks with carvings were found in some Bronze Age monuments and early excavations. And um, this was essentially informing us that the carvings were created just before or at the same time as the monuments. In most cases, the dating of the monuments was extrapolated into the rock art itself. So the rock art was considered to have been placed or created or um, being part of the monument which was dated to um, the Bronze Age. Even today there are many people who tend to consider this rock art um, as dating to the Bronze Age. And in addition we we also see uh, certainly in in early uh, research as we research we also see British researchers looking at Iberia for further consolidating of their um, of these dates. And this is because in Iberia as I mentioned we also have the same type of cup and ring motifs being found um, carved alongside uh, weapons of um, well weapons that are very detailed uh, and for which there, there are material counterparts being uh, being found in um, in excavations and that can, can provide very precise chronologies and so what we have here is a, a circular argument where uh, British British researchers go to Iberia to find um, so uh, to find to find evidence for dating for them so they're saying these cup and rings are that we have in our country as well um, are carved alongside the weapons and so in the same surfaces and so they must be from the bronze age uh, and then you have iberian researchers coming to uh, to britain and saying well you know these carved stones with cup and rings and and uh, cup marks were found within the bronze age monuments and so um, what we have is probably from the bronze age as well However, today we believe that the rock art was first created in the Neolithic period, so around 6,000 to 4,000 years ago. Um, and this is supported by the discovery of cut marked rocks in Neolithic monuments, such as the Long Cairn at Daladies in Aberdeenshire, which dates to 3,280 BC. Um, also, some excavations of um, a rock art panel at Torvlara near Kilmartin in Argyll which also provided Neolithic dates from deposits on and around the rock surface um, and also excavations of a carved rock at Hunterhue um, in Northumberland which revealed that an early Bronze Age burial had been built over earlier and very eroded motifs. Um, and also if we look at the wider context we also have very good evidence for example coming from Ireland uh, that shows that this rock art can be more or less placed uh, in the Middle Neolithic. And so what also these excavations are showing us um, is that there are um, is other associated activities with the production of rock art. So we see, uh, for example, in Torvlar and a platform being associated with a rock art and a post hole structure uh, that was found near the base of a carved rock. There, there were lots of quartz and quartzite pebbles uh, found scattered on the floor of this platform. Uh, and so these finds are also bringing the rock art closer to people. So we're having a better insight, not only of dates, but also of the type of activity that would be carried out um, around and associated with the rock art. So, but what does this all mean? What, what is the rock art? What is the significance of the rock art? We have a problem with this type of rock art, with the planted rock art in the first place, because the, 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 the geometries and the design of the rock art is very, abstract and um, I don't want to use the word simple but we do see it repeated in many contexts around the world um, and so the shapes 
can have a number of meanings and we know that from um, you know ethnographic um, examples for example um, the people in central Australia to whom a carved circle, a carved circle um, or a, a simple circle can mean a number of different things. It can mean, you know, the ones that you can read on, on, on the screen, an egg, a hill, an entrance into the ground, a circular path, breasts, campsite, tree. And so it will depend on where the motifs are carved um, and associated with what. Um, all of this will have an implication in um, the meaning of the rock art. And if we don't know the, the, the meaning of the, of the signs themselves, um, looking at the different locations where we find it and the associations that we find it with, um, it is very complicated to actually have a, a good understanding of the meaning of the rock art. However, um, obviously there's been a lot of suggestions, a lot of theories about it um, and uh, early thoughts. So early, early uh, researchers have suggested that these were, for example, ancient forms of writing, that they were landscape maps, which you, you will still find this theory today, that there were plans of sites, plans of, of, um, of hut circles, um, gaming boards, that they were symbols with some kind of um, religious or ritual importance, that they were merely ornamental designs, or that they were astronomical charts. And the images that you can see here uh, were created by Ludovic, the man who had his own theories about how uh, this rock art related to the cosmos and how it could be used uh, to predict solar eclipses. Famously, also Ronald Morris um, had a, um, a list of 104 theories for what the rock art uh, could mean. He ranked these in order of plausibility, so then 10 being certainty or nearly so, 5 being a reasonably sensible idea, um, which may not be true, or 0 being a seemingly impossible idea. So some of the ideas that he puts through, he, he says that the rock art can be related to astronomical symbolism and alignments, again maps of the, of the landscape and fertility symbolism, which are uh, you know, relatively plausible, but he also suggests that they can be messages from the outer space and other uh, types of, um, of interpretations that are possibly less likely. So more academic theories tend to view, um, or at least recently, since at least since the, uh, since the 1980s, um, there's been um, a, a turn in, in the way that rock art uh, has been studied and uh, we see the introduction of what we call landscape archaeology which tends to, to relate the rock art with the landscape where it is located and in fact if you think about it we have the motifs to study but the only other thing that we can actually relate the rock art with is its landscape because even if we dig it we often don't find anything and we can never really be sure if the um, deposits that we're finding are directly related with with the rock art. And so Richard Bradley um, wrote a very important book in 1997 um, and, uh, and he offered a new perspective into, uh, into the study of rock art which completely changed the way that uh, we, we look at it these days. Uh, he looked at potential interregional connections between Britain and, and particularly the northwest of Spain, for example, um, because there are these all these connections and these similarities. Um, his work was also underpinned by principles of social anthropology and structuralism, so he was not only interested in looking at the motifs themselves, but also understand what um, this, um, this uh, um, system of, uh, of um, of designs meant and what was the, uh, the the social implications for the people who created them. And so he associated it with ways of organizing the territory. Um, he, he gave a lot of importance to um, the fact that there were wide uh, views from these sites. Um, he also mentioned that these were potentially um, associated with routes of mobility um, and could also be potentially a, um, um, a strategy of communication between groups of people who uh, were sharing a territory, were sharing the landscape and all the resources that the landscape was offering, but that they would not necessarily see, them, see each other uh, personally or they would never come across each other. So a means of communication. Um, that's what he suggested. Um, at the same time, we also have some very interesting work um, 
in uh, in uh, in the same lines uh, in uh, in Ireland and for example Purcell um, studied um, the Rock Garden County in um, in uh, in County Kerry and uh, and she and she uh, concludes that the rock art, the location of the rock art was influenced by um, the landscape itself and it was connected to the different valley systems that existed um, in, um, in, exist in that area. On your left side, you see a really interesting work developed by uh, Blaise O'Connor, again in Ireland, and Blaise O'Connor developed um, a methodology that used a number of, of different types of, uh, of technology. So she used uh, uh, geographic information systems to look at several variables of the landscape in relation to the rock art. Uh, and she also conducted geophysical um, surveys and excavations. Um, and she offered a much more um, refined idea of the, um, of, of, uh, the chronology of the rock art, as well as all the activities that uh, are carried um, around it. And so the fact is that we will never really know the original meaning and the intentions underpinning the creation of the rock art research, uh, uh, of the rock art, but, but some research has been suggesting that some remnants of the prehistoric oral traditions may possibly be part of our modern um, culture as well, and that may reach us in the form of uh, folk tales. Um, and it's interesting to note that even today, um, that you know, people are not don't have clear um, connections with the landscape anymore. Certainly not um, in 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 Europe or in parts of Europe. Um, but we still have uh, these folk tales. We can still find the stories um, and the associated lore with the rock art, certainly in Scotland. And so there are some main themes that uh, that we can see coming across. So we see that um, a lot of these folk tales have to do with fairies and giants. Often they are the last place where the fairies were were, were seen. For example, there's a lot of folk tales associated with magic and witchcraft, um, and um, uh, and also fertility rites. Um, and uh, and also healing. So interestingly, there's a, there's a few rocks, and certainly some of the ones that you can see in these pictures that were associated with the potential to uh, to cure. So people would go there and they would do certain rituals um, because they would be um, cured. But also, there are um, there are other um, accounts of a widespread practice, particularly in the Highland, that would involve pouring cow's milk in the hollowed or cut marked stone to appease the local spirit um, and ensure that the herds and the crops were safe. And this illustrates a really close relationship between people and the supernatural. Um, and so, if we think about these uh, these cat troughs, like, like what they're called, um, if we think about them. Um, and if, and if they don't really, if they're not carried out in, in the oral tradition, then for us, they're just merely cup marks, but they could have, even the simple cup marks could, could actually have held uh, important meanings and important functions um, for people. So in terms of the record that we find uh, or the record that we were dealing with, um, there are lots of inconsistencies in the, in, in the record um, of, um, that we started to deal with. Uh, so what we get is inaccurate descriptions of the rock art. We have uh, in Kenmore lots of duplicated entries in the official in in Kenmore and other official databases. Uh, we have lots of recordings of natural features that um, are recorded as cup marks, for example. Um, and so uh, it's very hard to uh, conduct any type of research with with um, inaccurate records. So we needed something. Um, more um, systematic to be able to understand what this rock art uh, or, or understand more um, about this rock art. And that's where uh, Scotland's Rock Art Project begins. So uh, this is a five-year project, uh, five-year program. We are just about entering the last last year of the project. It, was, it is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council from the UK, and it's run by Historic Environment Scotland. And we also have a collaboration with Edinburgh University and, and uh, Glasgow School of Arts. This is essentially a community-led project, and uh, we aim to record and research and raise awareness of prehistoric rock art across um, Scotland. From the initial map that I showed with 2,700 and 
95, I think it was, uh, rocks. We now have a record with uh, 3,300 uh, and something of which 1,301 uh, rocks have been uh, recorded following a systematic methodology so far. So what we've been doing is we work with local communities and uh, we relocate known rock art from uh, that map that I showed you before. Uh, we also survey the surrounding areas and check for new occurrences. We confirm and collect accurate grid references that will be important not only to go back uh, to the um, to the sites and, and be able to monitor them, but also to um, carry out, for example, spatial analysis with the geographic information systems. We produce detailed descriptions of the rock art motifs, the rock surface, the out, uh, you know, the outcrop or the boulders, the landscape settings. We also carry out um, an assessment of the imminent risks to which the rock art may be exposed. We capture oriented photographs of the landscape, the panel, the motifs, and we produce 3D models. So 3D models are essentially a reproduction of the, um, a three-dimensional reproduction of the, um, of the rock art, which we do uh, capturing a series of overlapping images that we then um, process in a dedicated software. And we, uh, we, we tend to use 3D modeling because one is a very quick way to record rock art and it saves us a lot of time. Uh, we don't have to carry out uh, or carry around generators for raking light if we were to do uh, direct tracing, which was a traditional way of recording rock art. It was really time consuming. We'd be, have, we'd be uh, uh, drawing over plastic, which was over the rock. So um, also 3D modeling, um, that allows us to kind of record the rock without any context. So we're not compromising any or destroying the rock or contributing for any destruction of the rock. Uh, it can be done at any time of the day. We can quite easily model small rocks and large panels. Um, and uh, it can also um, uh, uh, help us to identify rock that uh, rock art that sometimes is quite invisible uh, because in some cases they are very, very weathered. The motifs are very, very weathered. And the other thing is that we don't have the subjectivity of, um, of, of recording it, of a human record of, of the rock. So if you look on the left side, you have two images of the same panel. And if you compare the motifs that we uh, recorded with a 3D model on the top, and if you look at the record on the bottom, you will see how different they are. And so this is giving us a much um, deeper insight into um, what is actually depicted in the rock with less um, subjectivity. Also on the right, um, this is an example of, of a rock that I recorded for a previous project, uh, but you can tell how useful this can be. So if you look at this rock, you, you can barely see anything, but the 3D model then revealed all of the rock art that was carved on that on that rock. In some cases, we can actually feel the rock art with our fingers and others, that's not even possible, but but the 3D modeling really uh, brings out the motifs and, uh, and we are able to um, identify rock art a lot more um, accurately. So digital technologies and 3D modeling have really revolutionized the way that we deal with rock art and it has, and it, and it has really introduced a lot of change in the way that we conduct our research. Um, and so the 3D modeling has been able to, has been helping us to address a lot of uh, old questions, but also a lot of new questions. Uh, and, and creating new avenues of investigation. So in terms of the motifs themselves, we can look at their details, enabling us to create more detailed classifications that are actually meaningful um, and that we can relate to other features of the rock art. Um, we can also identify, better identify the type of depictions of the rock art um, and, and, uh, and how it relates to the rock art surface. So one of the things that we are noticing is that there is a very, very strict relationship, tight relationship between the carving and the natural features. So we know that they were using specific features of the, of the rock surface, of the micro topography of the rock to create this rock art, as you can see um, on this, um, on the second image um, top right. Um, and uh, where they use this this uh, this raised area of the uh, of the uh, outcrop to create all of these rings around. 
And so we're being able to identify all of these intricacies of the rock art and also um, have a better idea of how they were incorporating um, the natural features, for example, um, into, the, uh, into the composition. So we see uh, a lot of fissures, natural fissures that are being used as radials, for example. Um, we have, again, natural fissures that are dividing or enclosing motifs. We have solution holes that are being transformed into cut marks. Um, so we have a much, much uh, deeper insight uh, and understanding of how the rock art was, creating, was created. And we're also being able to uh, identify superimpositions, which were thought to be practically um, absent, or we thought that there could be some, but they were never really demonstrated. And, and 3D modeling has been enabling us to actually uh, point out and identify them in, in, um, in detail. So we now know that there are superimpositions, in fact. And so, as I said, in this process, we have been able to confirm the existence of these superimpositions um, and also finding something else that is really interesting, which is uh, the erased motifs, which you can see there in the blue uh, squares. I know the images are not great, you're just going to have to trust me on this. But um, the erased motifs were, <clears throat> pardon me, initially identified, uh, or I, I, I first started seeing them in, uh, in Ireland, in County Kerry, on the open air rock art. Um, and they had never been spotted in this kind of context. They were only, they had only been um, studied or uh, in the context of megalithic art. So it's really interesting to start seeing these things uh, emerging as we um, conduct our, our research. And so um, our research is still ongoing, but we are now in a better position to offer a renewed perspective or a more comprehensive perspective of what prehistoric rock art is in Scotland. And so, uh, <clears throat> we can see that this tradition shares many features with the other regions in, uh, in Western Europe, as I mentioned, um, that there is a very striking relationship with the landscape, um, that this is a, a type of rock art that is to be outdoors in contact with the elements, um, that has a very strict relationship with uh, natural features, although we are also being able to see uh, regional variations, um, and not only in terms of the motifs that are carved, but also in the way that they are carved and, um, and other um, variables like that. Um, we can see that this rock art is preferentially carved on boulders and natural outcrops, but now we have a better um, understanding of the choice of media. So uh, the fact that we know that they would use specific um, features of the rocks to create the rock art may be an indication of why certain rocks were uh, chosen, for example. And although uh, there are some very prominent rocks in the landscape with very extensive decorations, um, we are now starting to think that perhaps this rock art was not necessarily a public art uh, because the majority of carvings were actually uh, done in very small and flat flush with the ground surfaces, making them quite invisible, uh, especially if you consider that, um, you know, natural weathering uh, and the seasonality of the, uh, of the vegetation. And so um, we are also starting to understand that uh, this type of rock art probably traveled from somewhere and from here to other places, although we don't really know where. Um, and it probably came and went with people, ideas, animals, other types of artifacts that we can find in the archaeological record. There is evidence for boat building, uh, boat building and seafaring skills that reinforce the notion that these greater journeys were taking place during this period, um, allowing us to establish more uh, strict connections or relations between um, these various uh, regions. And so what seems, what is emerging is that this Atlantic rock art is in itself a concept that was shared and it was adopted by many people across the Atlantic facade, but it was also interpreted locally, uh, although maintaining its main characteristics. And the same is true uh, for Scotland as uh, a territory, because we can see all of these variations as well in the record. Finally, uh, we're also starting to have a better understanding of the rock art's social and cultural roles in the past. So this tradition seems to be sitting very comfortably within the character of a Neolithic worldview in which stone seems to be a very important part of people's lives. 
stone built architect, uh, architectures um, were meant to endure in time. And probably so was this type of rock art carved onto outcrops and boulders that would fix that were fixed in one place, fixed to one place in the landscape. So the idea of modifying something so hard and durable uh, was probably um, quite significant. Um, it was a significant act of appropriation of something of a natural element. And in a way, this is a similar, it is similar to the transformation of the landscape that was, that was happening at that point as well with the construction of uh, monumental um, with other monumental types of sites and architectures. So there seems to be a deep connection to the landscape, which as we have established is also shared by um, Atlantic art. And this seems to be a very uh, particular aspect of Neolithic societies. But also the rock art has a certain character of intimacy and privacy, which is implicit as well in the Neolithic world, for example, with the large structures of stone, um, uh, in, the, in the funerary monuments being concealed by earth mounds or stone cairns like they were hiding. And if we follow the same kind of logic, we can also see this in the rock art itself, because although it was located in the wider landscape, the majority of outcrops and boulders were small, between small to medium sizes, which does not make them very prominent. Um, they were quite flat and, and flush with the ground. Um, and, and the carvings themselves were only visible for a, a short period of time, um, unless they were recarved over and over again. And at the moment, we don't really have evidence um, for that, but it is obviously possible. Um, and also, finally, uh, the transformation of the carved rocks and the landscape was not only physical, but there were also some social and cultural implications. So we see the society transforming itself, uh, but we also see the rock art transforming itself. And uh, at the end of the Neolithic, in the early uh, Bronze Age, we see the rock art being used in um, these uh, funerary monuments. And this somehow implies a different perception of the rock art. And there is a suggestion that the way that people were relating with the rock art was changing. Um, and so um, perhaps the worldview then was changing as well. Um, and the rock art was being reinterpreted uh, and incorporating in uh, other types of monuments. Interestingly, it wasn't necessarily abandoned. And I guess that now what we need to do is uh, understand why, um, why it changed. If you're interested in finding out more about the project, uh, that's our website. We also have a Facebook page. We do uh, two um, weekly updates uh, and we have all of our 3D models available on Sketchfab. We have now over 800 3D models available uh, that you can um, find on Sketchfab. If you have any doubts, uh, please contact me or my colleague Tosha. We have our um, our uh, emails on this slide as well. Thank you. There was a, a, a discussion as to whether there was any um, sites in Easter Ross and East, East Sutherland that um, I think Tertia said there weren't many sites in Canmore, which I guess is what you have to go off. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, so um, we are prioritizing in our records, we are prioritizing the sites that we have uh, in, uh, in Canmore. Mm. Uh, and uh, and there are some there are some new sites being found, uh, but we we have focus we have focus in other areas. So I think uh, all that we know for that area is what's in Canmore at the moment. Mm. We were we were sadly interrupted by COVID in our field work. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, we know that feeling. Um, uh, oh, I've lost it again now. Kenny was saying, how um, do you, how often or do you get ever get rings without the central cup, or is it always cup and then ring? It is, it is, it, it tends to be a uh, cup and ring. Uh, there are some examples of just rings, just concentric rings, but they are, they tend to be rare. Hmm. Okay. There was, there was a couple of questions about the type of rock and I know you did, you did talk about whether they were flat or whether they were boulders or monumental. Did they have any preference for the actual kind of geological type of rock? Hard, soft? Well, um, in Scotland, we tend to see them carved all over the all over the place. So in different types of geology, you know, there's just such a, a wide variety of, of geological um, rocks here, and uh, we 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 tend to see them. We we also we've even found rock art in Nice in the Western Isles, so mm -hmm. um, which is quite hard, yeah. uh, but we tend to see it everywhere. I mean, I think that locally, um, I think that they would probably go with what they have locally. Um, 
but um, but yes, we, we do have it all, all over the place in, in all types of geology. Interesting. And then um, Lorraine was saying, is, and again, you touched on this, is there evidence of a buildup of designs over millennia? You were saying that now the superimpositions suggest that they yes. work. Yes. Yeah, so we are finding superimpositions and we also have some examples of uh, phasing. So we can see where, for example, uh, parts of the rock has uh, come off and they recarved it. So we are trying, we are being able to have a better understanding of phasing in, in some in some specific uh, rocks. But um, this does not mean that we understand its chronology uh, at the moment anyway. Yeah, fascinating. And it also does it suggest as an amateur, it does it suggest that it's the, the, the rock that's the important thing, not so much the art, if they're happy to erase somebody else's and start again. Maybe it's the location that's critical. It's probably a combination of factors. So the symbols are obviously uh, quite important because uh, otherwise they wouldn't be repeated on thousands of rocks um, so extensively. Thousands of rocks with many, many thousands of, um, of motifs. Um, so the motifs are definitely important, so much so that you find them all over, you know, across Western Europe. Um, that, that's how important they were. Why they were important, we don't quite know. But we also know that the relationship with the landscape was uh, significant because that's where we consistently find, find this type of rock art. So there's definitely this link. Uh, I don't think that we can understand one without the other, to be honest. Yeah, fascinating. Um, there were a few questions around the sort of lack of rock art in or records of in France and Germany. Is, is that research bias or do you think there's not so much there? Where, sorry? France and Germany. In France and Germany, in terms of this type of rock art or other types of rock art? Well, I think this, I think this sort, yes. Well, this type of rock art is very specific to these regions. Uh, in France, for example, uh, we have all the monuments, but we don't have a lot of uh, of knowledge of um, open air art, so we don't see this type of rock art carved on the outcrops. Now, this could be because people just haven't really been looking for it, because obviously you have all the the, the cave paintings, and you have uh, Montbego in France, which also has a lot of, uh, of 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 rock art. You have the monuments that are much um, they kind of outshine everything else really in that area, uh, and so it could be a research bias. Um, but we haven't found any kind of landscape art like this yet in the area. There are some very, very um, um, elusive references, but uh, of a rock that was found in like the 1800s or something, but is now destroyed. So it, 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 there's nothing very consistent for the area. Um, as for Germany, I have no idea. I know that there's Paleolithic art in Germany, but I don't really study Germany. So unfortunately, I don't know much about it. Fair enough. <laughs> um, is there any evidence of rock art being transported and, and imposed on monuments rather than it always being engraved in situ? Could they ever engrave and take it? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, obviously we can't really say uh, where it came from, but we do have um, small portable blocks uh, that uh, that were, you know, in many cases were probably quarried elsewhere and then brought into the monument specifically when they are, um, for example, in in the, in Cairn Holly in in Dumfries and Galloway, uh, you have this one block um, with a cup and six rings, and clearly it came from somewhere else. It was quarried and it was placed there actually in the secondary deposit anyway. So it wasn't there when they built the monument, and we know that it was brought in with a number of other types of artifacts. So yes, clearly it's coming from from other places. Uh, we may not be able to say where they were coming from, but uh, yeah, we can see that we can see that dynamic in the construction and, and the reuse of the monuments. Brilliant. Um, Somebody was asking whether, have you, have you found any significance or any, you said about drove roads and, and markings for paths, any, any correlation with ley lines or healing lines in the landscape? Personally, no, I haven't. Yeah. But, but there's, the, I know that there are some people who, uh, who uh, uh, study that sort of relationship. Yeah. But not, not me personally. Yeah. Interesting. Um, oh, it's difficult to know how many to do. Um, when you say erase, do you mean by human error effort? Do you think they're deliberately wiping out the other people's or was it, is it erosion and then they cracked on? Can you tell that? No, no, it's, it's deliberate. It's deliberate. So uh, there are two ways of, of, uh, of seeing it. So it could be that they created a motif that for some reason was wrong or they wanted to erase it and then they just pack it, peck it very, um, you know, like they want to really kind of get the motif off. 
Um, but the thing is that it usually has the same shape and uh, it, it, it is often connected with other motifs. So it does look like it's part of the whole composition itself. Um, but it, no, it's still early days, so we're still kind of assessing that. But uh, that, that's what it's suggesting at the moment. Interesting. And uh, this is a great question for someone like me. Uh, what, what tools were they using? Were they using other rocks? Sorry? Other rocks or? Did they yes, have other, other flint. Yeah, uh, lithics mostly. Uh, so pebbles, um, chisels, perhaps, um, you know, other types of, uh, of, uh, of stone tools, definitely stone tools at this stage anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, we and oh, well, I thought we were getting. Um, you said the rocks would have been visible for a short time, um, just towards the end there, when you were saying some of them might be done for private viewing. Are you thinking, kind of like a lifetime or a season or a a few years? Well, it's hard to say. But if we think about, so the rocks sometimes are really small and they're quite flush with the ground. Um, so, you know, just over winter, the vegetation grows and then suddenly you stop seeing them. You know, um, there is that. And then if you think about the weathering of the grooves, for example, there are some experimental um, examples. There's not been uh, a systematic study uh, of experimental archaeology to, to determine these things, but there's there are a few examples that have shown that uh, the motifs stop being so visible after two, three years. So it's really not a very extensive period of time that we can see that vivid core of the rock coming through. Um, and so that's when the weathering of the, of the, of the rock starts to, uh, to, to be more, um, more visible, which makes them a little bit less um, perceptible in the landscape. So if you think about that, and if you think about how they can be covered by the vegetation, uh, or even, or even atmospheric conditions, you know, um, it might be that you have, you know, our Atlantic kind of weather and you have lots of fog and suddenly you don't even see the big boulders, um, you know, that often. So there's a lot of things to think about, but it does seem like some of them were definitely made and created to be seen. We have big um, uh, boulders, big outcrops with lots of carvings. Um, and if they didn't see the carvings, at least they would see the rocks and perhaps that would be um, something that would, uh, uh, you know, be appealing for them to check out. But in other cases, you know, you have rocks that are about this big uh, that you just just randomly stumble upon. And uh, those were definitely not not to be seen by, by everyone. I think that there is this kind of uh, intimate relationship by whoever made it and, uh, and, and the rock itself. So. Mm, lovely. There's a suggestion just coming at the end there with, um, to what extent could soil accumulation over the millennia have flattened out the stones? Do you see that? Flattened. Well, so sunk the, effectively sunk the rocks into the increasing soil level. Well, we definitely have rocks that are covered. Uh, there's, you know, we have the buildup of the peat and, uh, and there are definitely rocks that are covered by, by peat that, that we, we haven't found yet. And, uh, you know, that sometimes keep being, you know, found. Um, so, but uh, yeah. That in. Okay, I think we'll just have one more and then we'll move on to Lisa because we need to hear yeah. a bit of local one as well. Um, but I think this is really interesting from Leah. Um, could you, could you, is there any suggestion of the rock art being interpreted as writing? Um, is it storytelling in any way or an accompanying an oral history tradition? No, not really. It's just it was just one of the early interpretations, you know, because you see signs uh, uh, and uh, and I think that people just uh, just thought that they were more likely um, you know, ancient writings, but there's nothing, there's nothing specific about it. There's no oral history, no nothing. It's just, it's just an early idea, I think. Okay, fabulous. Well, thank you so much. Um, I mean, obviously, Joanna's going to stay on for a bit. We'll hand over to Lisa and Claire now for their conversation, and then we'll, we'll have an opportunity for a few more questions at the, at the end. Excellent. Thanks, Helen. Right. Hi, Lisa. So we know that Hi. you've led one of the, you lead one of the volunteer teams for the project. So which area does your group cover, Lisa? We're based in Dumfries and Galloway. There's two teams in Dumfries and Galloway and we are the easternmost one. Um, there's another one based further in the west over in Wigtonshire. Um, most of our survey work is done around Kikubri, which is marked on the, I think it's marked on the map, um, which is roughly halfway along um, uh, Dumfries and Galloway, uh, so we're sort of fairly central. Um, yeah, uh, 
think that's yeah. Next slide, I think. Yeah. Well, how did you get started with the project, Lisa? And how do you go about? How did your team go about finding and then recording the raw cart as you're going along? Um, well, there's, we have uh, three core members at the moment uh, in our group, and uh, we've all been with the project since the beginning. And I think I'm hopefully right in saying we, we all attended the same talk that Joanna gave to our local history society uh, in Kakubri, uh, and we were all really you know, inspired by that and wanted to get involved. Um, so after that, we went on a, a, a training session or several training sessions. Uh, and then we, we got stuck into field work. Um, uh, so, so you, so you want to just go over what, I'll, I'll run through what, yeah, what the field us, work is. Yeah. yeah. Perfect, thanks. Yeah. yeah um, mm -hmm. So field work, as, uh, so, as has already been mentioned, um, mm -hmm. uh, the sites are taken off the database for Camwell database. Um, so we're working from that. Um, so you you find out which sites you want you want to survey in your area, mm -hmm. um, and then we have the task of uh, a finding out where the site is, um, how you're going to get there, and also contacting the landowner. Although we have right to roam in Scotland. Um, we don't like to just march onto the site and start, you know, sort of digging around and things. Um, we do get in touch with the landowners just to make sure that they're okay with us. They don't don't mind and we like to tell them about the project so they know what we're doing and get them on board as well. Um, and it makes sense because uh, the example I've got here is the very first rock we surveyed, which was uh, a very detailed panel, really beautiful. Uh, but it happens to be in somebody's back garden. Um, it is a very large back garden, but obviously you can't just march in and start poking around in someone's garden. So um, it's, you know, it's good to to, to uh, build up a rapport with the with the landowner as well. Um, and also, a lot of our sites are based just outside Kukubri on a, a military base. Uh, it's an MOD, um, and they do a lot of also they do a lot of training up there. They have their explosives, etc. So you, you need to make sure that you're not going to be visiting on a day that they are, uh, you know, doing their training exercises because that's you know, pretty disastrous, really. Um, and also, um, obviously, very we're a very rural area. There's a lot of uh, livestock in fields as well. Um, so sometimes, you know, you might not be a good time to go if there's a bull in the field or whatever. So mm -hmm. <laughs> things like that. So um, so there's a bit of pre-survey work. Um, um, it's field work. You can see the cows there. You've got yeah, no yeah, that's a, <laughs> that's a <laughs> yeah. This is um, up at higher banks. Uh, there's more often than not cattle in the field, sometimes sheep. Um, <laughs> they, they tend to congregate actually on the rock, so that that was a slightly problematic at times because they're quite young and quite um, energetic and curious. So um, we had to keep sort of shooing them off um, <laughs> so we could actually actually survey the rock. Um, what we actually do on site, so that sort of the survey method, obviously you can see there we've got um, sheets work sheets were working from there so we're recording uh, the core information of you know the uh, just basic stuff like uh, the date and the, the weather um, uh, what the location obviously um, we, we do have a GPS now so we can we can have get that more accurately which is obviously uh, going to be much more valuable you know in the future as well for people relocating uh, the rocks uh, unfortunately you know Sometimes finding them because of, because the surveys were done before pre G GPS. You know, sometimes it's quite challenging to actually find mm -hmm. find the rocks from from the old records. Mm -hmm. um, the con we record the context, so that that's you know sort of what kind of landscape it is. It, is it you know is it a forestry or is it um, is it farmland? Is it agricultural? If it's pasture, what kind of pasture is it? Is it rough pasture? Improved pasture? Um, mm -hmm. That kind of thing. Um, is it is it on land that's sloping? Is it on a hillside? Is it at the top of a hill? Is it at the bo bottom of a hill? Things like that. Um, mm -hmm. We take measurements, so we're, we, we'll have things obviously like tape measures. You can see it in there a, a compass. Um, usually, we take photographs before we start, uh, mm -hmm. and 
matter that, like, said, uh, like Joanna said, a lot of times the rock's actually quite hidden, so we might actually have to remove the turf. I think you can see in that photograph that uh, the turf's been rolled back, so uh, we might have to use a knife to cut the turf, uh, but that's the only sharp instrument we'll be allowed um, to use. Uh, the rest of the time we'll just use, like, um, we use kitchen spatulas, actually. Um, they're very good because they don't scratch the rock. Um, we're not, like I said, we're not allowed to use metal. Um, sometimes you see um, old plough marks on the rock and that, and then you know it does show that they, you know, metal do can damage the rock. And um, obviously, it makes a bit more can make it a bit more confusing when you've got you're trying to record the motifs. You know, you've got you know another little bit of a, a slice in there. You know, it's like you don't want to be recording things that are actually prehistoric. Um, <laughs> um, what else have we got in the bag? We got a, oh, we got a brush, yeah, um, and that's just to to clean the rock up with, you know, and get all the debris off. Because when we do the final photographs, um, we want it looking its best. And uh, obviously, for the, the photogrammetry, um, it's uh, we've got to take lots of overlapping pictures. So the cleaner and smoother the surface we, we've got it obviously the better the quality image we'll get with that um so so that covers i think that covers like the, the panel so we'll, we'll take the length and width and the height of the panel as well and uh, also the slope um uh, so we've got uh this little bit of kit called a clinometer i don't know kit. So it's got a compass on it, um, and so we can measure the direction that they, the panel's sloping in, um, and also the amount of degrees of slope it has. So we go to the minimum amount of slope to the maximum amount of slope, and um, all, all these uh, parameters can be used, I guess, in a. Um, uh, in a the computer programs, um, so the, the more the more details you've got, the more uh, things the computer's got to correlate things on. I guess um, is mm -hmm. how, it, how it works. Uh, um, and as John mentioned, we we also um, record uh, access, um, um, whether it's on a public right of way or. Um, if it's a, you know how if there's other buildings or other um, things like a quarry next to it or things like that and that and that also might impact on um, the risks to it to the rock mm. art as well. That's a lot of detail that's very impressive the records that they're putting together for this project actually considering the hundreds and thousands of records that are getting produced that's amazing but uh, get back to you Lisa for the next slide. <laughs> okay yeah um, so I again um, John has already um, um, talked about this but just just uh, an, another brief description. So they, the the three D models are created um, by the um, process of photogrammetry, um, and essentially um, that involves us taking lots of overlapping pictures. They they must be overlapping. That is, I think, the key to how it works. And it goes through several processes to produce a model. Um, um, which we've, I think we've already seen a shot of the model, haven't we? But hopefully we might, might get to see another one uh, in a minute or two. Um, we don't actually do the processing ourselves. Um, that's beyond our in our team's uh, computer. Um, um, well, we don't basically we don't have a strong enough computer to do it. So uh, we just take the photos and upload them, and then uh, that's the only thing I do. Okay. Again. Uh, as John has already shown us, the, uh, how you can see how um, it enhances uh, the image, um, which is useful. Well, the other thing I forgot to mention was that on the mm -hmm. what we record as well, we also do sketches. Um, and I think we saw some sketches earlier, and we saw how when you draw it with your naked eye, you might not. There's a lot of things you might miss. Whereas the 3D models, that's where they really come in because you know they really detect things that you haven't recorded so it's, it's a good it's a good it's a good backup as well really you know so it's, it's kind of the belts belts and braces uh, to, have all, to have all these things a lot of people think that why do you need to take the sketches then but it, it is a I think it's a it's a good um, good practice to mm -hmm. to do both it makes you really look at the, the art as well 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can take notes when you're on site, but sometimes you affect the final interpretation thing. So yeah, I think that's good. Um, so as well as doing all this recording side of things, the projects also enabled you to have some other experiences as well, haven't it, Lisa? Some other fun things going on. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, what, um, what we call the, the social engagement side, yeah. Um, I am more tend to be more involved with that now rather than the field work. I haven't managed to get out a lot lately myself. Um, so I've decided to focus more on the, the social engagement side um, and so in the last two years uh, we've had, uh, I was interviewed for BBC Radio Scotland's Out of Doors programme, um, actually that was, they do it on, on site so um, it was um, it's quite interesting because I think I, he started recording me as I was climbing up the hill so there was an awful lot of panting going on so which was a bit disconcerting but anyway it, it was it was good um, it was a good experience uh, and it's good publicity for the project as well um, there's a couple of local um, articles in local local the local newspaper gallery news and a little green directory publication um, these were all these were done ready to try and promote the project and to try and recruit new members, um, which um, we're still always interested in uh, as well. Um, January this year, um, I was asked to do a presentation for our local National Trust for Scotland group. Um, so I did a presentation that were about 60 ish people there. Um, so that, that was really good. And last October, so that's what, a year ago now, we, we did an event. With yourselves, <laughs> um, <laughs> and we can you dig it uh, actually to put, um, yeah, as we can see from the photos of the high banks. Uh, we we're, we're, were lucky that day with the weather. Uh, I think we got about 13 people in attendance, which was we were, we were quite impressed with that. Uh, we, um, yeah, so yes, there's lots of stunning examples of rock art in Dumfries and Galloway, particularly in Kirkcudbury. So have you got a favourite that you want to talk about? Have you got some particular favourite examples? Um, yeah, well, I suppose it has to be really one of the high bands. <laughs> yeah, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, it is because of it, the, the sheer number of carvings on it. Um, mm -hmm. and, um, the size, the scale of it. Um, it's in a beautiful location um, and it's also re relatively accessible. Um, we do have some really um, stunning examples in Dumfries and Galloway, um, but you know, as we've seen before, so sometimes they're in someone's garden and other times they might be in a field and they're literally, you know, they're under a lot of turf because um, we do, we do reflect if if one's covered up, we, we do replace the turf um, so that it does provide protection for it. Um, so they're not always obvious, obvious, you know, and uh, I think they went to one and it's actually underneath the cattle feeder. So, you know, you'd have to be pre pretty keen to want to see it, you know, because you, you know, um, mind you, I'm sure they move the cattle feeder around, but, um, <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, at least with the one at High Banks is, it is a scheduled monument. So, there is a little bit of a, a car park up there. It's not the easiest road to get to, but it is relatively accessible and, and very stunning. So, yeah, sorry, I could have gone on and on about it, but <laughs> it's also very close to where I live, so I have to see it's very, that's an, another added bonus to me. But <laughs> yeah. um, this is some more ties with it. Yeah, there's actually, it was also, I just wanted to make another little um, connection with um, because Kikubri is known as the artist town um, and we have um, one particular artist uh, is associated with, with Kikubri and that's Edward Atkinson Hornell um, who was very successful in his, in his lifetime and um, he was also a, an amateur archaeologist and he actually um, is credited with discovering um, in the modern era anyway, um, high banks uh, and was very instrumental in, uh, in it sort of excavating it and, and finding it and um, the image on the left is a, a, one of his drawings that he did as panels um, and 
he he's also thought that it's, it, it influenced his artwork as well because um, he discovered it in 1887 uh, and then we see his painting in 1889 I don't know if, it's, if you just make out the moon at the back but it's got the rings around it it looks very much like cup and rings mm. um, mm -hmm. and also he um, pretty much soon after discovering it um, he had um, plaster cast not sorry not plaster cast they are concrete cast actually uh, the ones mm. outside and they're outside our local museum in Cathedral mm. uh, and so um, in a way, sort of created the first 3D model of, of you know, of a uh, rock art, if you like, really. You know? um, yeah. mm -hmm. I love that painting. It's yeah, it's different, but I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, I'm not sure I'd want it on my wall, but yeah, it's good. <laughs> I might go. Yeah, <laughs> quite a few. Mm -hmm. um, is this right? Oh, oh. fingers so crossed. I think we're yeah. So from the first 3D model to. Uh, the, the ones we have now. Um. <laughs> yes, this is from Sketchfab, isn't it? The rock art for high banks, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can see it's a big piece. It's a big sample, isn't it? It's a large amount of rock. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, I can't remember. I think, I think it might be maybe five meters long or something. You know, this. Yeah. I think it's like five meters in length. The whole pattern, you know, panel. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a really good way of being able to see it in total because it's very hard if you're taking a normal photograph to to get mm -hmm. all of it in, you know. So. Yeah, uh -huh, that's very true. And it's got various, you record all the different types of symbols and how many there are and things like that, don't you, when you're doing your... We do, yes. You're right, I forgot to mention that. Yes, no? yeah, we do. Yeah, yeah. so uh, on, on something like this, it, it's quite... <laughs> It was it was quite um, complicated, and actually, it's one of the things I meant to point out. Actually, was um, especially the one that has the one that looks a bit like a hogback stone. It has many many cups in it. Mm -hmm. um, it was quite quite difficult to count the number of those. Uh, mm -hmm. Imagine if you kind of count that, um, you could easily lose count of it. So, to help us, what we used were um, I don't know what these were. We we had we've had these from the beginning. I don't know if they're like gaming chips. Oh yeah. <laughs> and we game. literally we literally put them in the holes so that we know that we've counted that one. Um, oh. So it's not it's not um, it's quite amusing in a way because it's almost like because of one of the theories is that they were gaming boards. So, but yeah. you know, mm -hmm. uh, but you know, we're using this. I love, yeah, I love they, can, they, they do come in quite handy. I know other groups used beads, I think, or marbles and things, just mm -hmm. you know, just to help you counting them because I can't remember I think there was how many there were in there but I think it was probably more than a hundred so you know. mm -hmm. <laughs> hundred oh my god yeah I love how resourceful we are as archaeologists with you know spatulas and gaming pieces because <laughs> you know it's, it's great it's how we get by <laughs> um, so yeah just a couple of final questions for you um, have you got any thoughts yourself on the meanings of the car rings Lisa from all your work um, I, I, I kind of stopped thinking about it, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. I find a lot of the a lot of the theories are either very, very I find them almost too complicated um, mm -hmm. or too wacky. Um, some of them um, are, are improbable. Um, I just kind of stop thinking or worrying about what they mean. Or it's not. It's no, it's not, it's not important anymore to me. I guess what's, what feels more important is, um, why, why, why do we as humans need to know, um, uh, what the meaning is? You know, um, what, what it is about, what is it, is it about ourselves that we want to find a meaning in it? Um, I'm sure there was, they had a great meaning to the people that did them. Um, and that's kind of more interesting, really, that it, you know, meant to me for them. But um, yeah, it's almost like I don't know. It, it does provide an endless fascination, and I think one that we'll probably never answer, which means rock art will always be fascinating in that okay. sense. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, true. Mm -hmm. um, and finally, for yourself, Lisa, what have you taken from being involved in this project in the Scottish Rock Art Group? Um, well, I, I, Quite a lot of things, really. Um, obviously, I've made made new friends. I've been to 
different sites I wouldn't have gone to, seen some amazing some rock art. Um, to be honest, before I joined the project, I didn't really know anything about rock art. So I've learned a great deal um, and, you know, about archaeology in general. And um, it's also, I think it's given me more of an interest now in anthropology as well. Um, and it's also, it's, it's taken me out of my comfort zone. Um, you know, sort of giving presentations to people and, and doing this this evening as well is not something I would have envisaged doing, you know, mm -hmm. myself. So, yeah, and it's opportunities to, to learn new things, uh, technologies and things, and uh, to be involved in the project. But, um, and hopefully, you know, the, we're helping with the research and that's going to be useful, you know, in the future and helping to build on the knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, thank you very much, Lisa. That was really interesting. It's invaluable, I think, what you're doing for, for adding to the heritage record of these monuments kind of thing. Um, also, just so that everybody knows, um, as Lisa was saying, uh, they're always on the lookout for more volunteers. There's still a year to go in the project, as Joanna was saying. So the best way, if you do want to volunteer, is to email Joanna or Tertia. We will put up the email addresses on the social media as well um, if you haven't managed to get hold of them this evening so that's fine um, also I think is it 10 groups that are, that are across Scotland that you've got at the moment volunteering is that so yes there's across oh, a few oh. different locations yeah people are wanting to volunteer <laughs> so that's good um, and I'll hand it on to Helen for questions but thank you very much Lisa okay thank you <laughs> thank you um, Lisa really interesting and uh, great actually to have an insight into the role of the volunteer because you know it's easy to see the models at the end but it's really interesting to see the process that goes into that because um, you're contributing to the National Historic Record so it's important it's done right and it's important that things stay the same for the future. Um, I'm going to be a bit cheeky those of you who know will know that I always do do this I'm just gonna before we do the final questions I'm just gonna put up a little bit of information about um, can you dig it so um, there's been plenty of discussion on the chat, but um, if, you, if you've enjoyed this and you'd like to keep up to touch with us, then you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Uh, Galloway Glens is at Galloway Glens. Uh, that's, the, as I say, the, the suite of 36 projects. If it's the archeology span that you like, then it's at GGLP Archeology, span and that's the Can You Dig It site. It's a, an almost daily dose of um, historical and heritage goodness. So um, I can recommend that for cheering you up in these, uh, in these trying times. Um, you can, we send out intermittent emails, not too often, but intermittent emails. If you'd like to do that, then email myself, helen.keron at dumbgal.gov.uk. And our website, gallowayglens.org, has got information about all of our projects and um, loads of videos up there as well. I'll take the opportunity um, just to say, to appreciate what everybody's saying, which is thank you so much, Joanna and Lisa. Really, really good. Fascinating session. Um, could rock art, well again we're always speculating, I think we've learned that haven't we, but could the rock art have been seen as protection from evil spirits? Is that something that you've um, come across, Joanna? Um, we see that, well obviously about this type of rock art we don't, we don't know, um, but we do see that in other types of rock art, um, so yeah it's totally possible. It's interesting with the circle, isn't it? It's such a such a resonant image, like you said early, mm -hmm. earlier. Um, Tosh has been recruiting people to the Kilmartin team, which is great. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, um, is there any prospect for it continuing? People are asking the rock art project. I mean, I know it's difficult times. At, at the moment, we we don't know, but uh, with, yeah, at the moment there are no plans. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, oh, now this is an interesting one from Marcia. Correlation between the contemporary uh, Neolithic landscape and what it, and and our modern perception that the rock panels are found in open landscape. Um, that throws me back to Dr. Coralie Mills of our Dendro Chronicle one a few months ago, saying that in you know all of Scotland would have been wooded at one point virtually. Yeah. So, has there been any interest? You know, pollen records that could tell us that maybe it wasn't open then and it was wooded. Well, I think I think that. Um as you said, most, most of it would be uh, woodland So uh, at that point. So, um, you know, that, that would have implications in terms of um, the visibility from and towards the rocks and, uh, you know, intervisibility between rocks and all that, uh, what I mentioned about them being perhaps more intimate and private rather than something that was exposed in the landscape. Uh, so yeah, it would definitely have implications to the way that people would perceive the rock art. 
Yeah, and it is important to remember that it has changed so much. Yeah. Um, this is maybe one for Lisa, actually, from um, from Maggie. High Banks is scheduled monument. I mean, that is an important point. You can't go messing with scheduled monuments. Um, it, and she's saying, you know, how do you get permission from the landowner to visit? Um, to, to do well, the, right the, the well, the, <laughs> don't give away anything you don't want to do. But Maggie's just asking how you would go about doing the right thing in general, I guess. Um, yeah, well, that one was a fairly easy one for me because the landowner happens to also be my landlord as well. Um, so I literally <laughs> yeah, just uh, knocked on his door and asked him, but um, it's not always easy to find the landowner. Um, sometimes you do have to literally uh, knock on, on the door of you know somewhere that's nearby and ask, ask them, do you own this field? Or you know, often it isn't, often it's someone else in the next farm that happens to own that field or whatever. So sometimes it's it's not always easy, yeah. Um, yeah, but, but it is important, and it's yeah. especially important if it's a state. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, uh, we're also, we're not we're not doing anything um, really invasive, right? So if we remove the turf or replace it, um, you know, and obviously the last thing we want to do is actually damn it, damage the money. And um, if we were to do um, anything more, we would need to seek permission uh, from uh, historic. Uh, environment Scotland probably rather than you know um, but um, yeah. Yeah, thanks. I think the best thing to do if you do want to get involved um, in, a, in any significant way is, is to go through scrap and, and join the volunteer teams I'm delighted to, uh, to have you. Um, a, few, a few this is circling back to some earlier questions Joanna is there any rock art in Wales? Yeah, I can I can see people asking about that. Yes, there is. In fact, there is an organisation uh, called the Welsh Rock Art Organisation that you can find on Facebook and on the internet. So if you're interested in rock art in Wales, it might you know it's probably worth uh, looking out for them. Okay, that's a good one. Um, and then the, yeah, I wondered about this. Could rock art be process based rather than image focused? Is it just something to work on to keep your hands busy when you've got some leisure time? Um. You know, given the extent of the, you know, the number of sites that we have, the type of motifs that, are, I mean, why would they be doing always the same motifs if that was the case? You know, uh, they could they could quite easily um, be doing other things. Um, and it's probably, you know, it's probably a little bit harder to, you know, have the, the right tools and have the right skills. And so I think it's something more specialized than that. I don't, I don't think it's just about a matter of... Uh, spending time and getting away yeah yeah but um thank you as i say so much to joanna and lisa for giving up their time it's um it's been a really fascinating um evening i'm glad we had such a great turnout for it